yeah. So oh. I'm 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 the pathfinder. I'm the pathfinder. Suck it. No, I'm Scott Ryder, and I'm the pathfinder. Whatever. <sighs> We've had over a decade to come to love, appreciate, and almost idolize voices in one particular game series, Mass Effect. You've heard all the voice actors, the main ones on our show before, but there are some new voices that you need to hear from. This is a very, very, very important moment because you are not yet indoctrinated by their voices yet. I am joined by Tom Taylorson, Frida Wolf, the voices of the two protagonists of Mass Effect Andromeda. Thank you all for joining the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with you, Tom. Who are you playing? And then we'll go to, to you, Frida, for those that maybe aren't as familiar with uh, what's already been released about the game. I am the voice of the male protagonist, uh, Scott Ryder. And Frida? Killed it. <laughs> I am the voice right. of the male protagonist. I don't know why that's my dumb joke. I just like pretending we're still the same character. Um, I play Tom's sister, Sarah Ryder, who is also an option as a protagonist. And if you play as one of us, the other one still exists in the world. So it's not a, it's not an either or situation, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with you, Tom, because this is, again, a very big deal to a lot of people. Uh, Tom, how did you find out about this and uh, Mass Effect and this kind of opportunity, and was it really conveyed to you how big a deal this might be? Um, well, I think we all found out about the same way. You know, you get an audition from the agent, and uh, yeah. it shows up, and you send off the audition, and um, I knew right from the audition what the project was and the possibilities therein, because I've seen Bioware scripts before and whatnot, and even says in the bottom, you know, property of Bioware you know, do not transmit. So I knew what it was the second it, you know, passed my computer screen. So I it showed up and went to work. And I sent off a bunch of auditions for a variety of characters. And then this is the one that somehow they thought, yeah, this guy can do that. Sure. Similar sort of story there, Frida? Same with you? Not at all. Not okay. even remotely. Um, EA has a pile of dummy scripts that they send out on a regular basis um, that are... Names and change and no location, and they're just really generic scripts to find out, can you be a human mm -hmm. um, in various contexts? And, um, I mean, they've hung on to these scripts for a while. I've, I've auditioned with these scripts like two years in a row. And um, so I didn't know what I was auditioning for, and I didn't know what the part was for, and I had no context whatsoever, and I booked off of that. So, and in, in video games, we very rarely get uh, scripts that are that are openly, especially if the uh, project isn't announced yet, you don't know what it is or who it's for. You just get a, if you book it, you get a studio time date and a place to go to. So I just showed up and um, Caroline Livingstone, who's the main VO producer over at Bioware, Skyped in and she said, hi, Frida, so nice to meet you. Um, welcome to Mass Effect, you're the player character. Okay, let's get started. I was like, what? And I didn't, like, we have, I mean, we don't have a endless time in a studio. A studio is booked to, um, up, you know, from one to four yeah. hours or however long. Um, so I was just like, okay, well, we'll put our little beauty pageant meltdown aside and um, just get to work. What the hell is happening? So, so you were aware of the franchise beforehand, though? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm not from space. I just pretend to be. <laughs> I'm just drawn that way. But, um, yeah, of course I was aware of the franchise. It was just I had no idea what job I was doing that day. So it's, I guess it's still kind of a shock a year later. Mm. Ever since this information has been released, because you guys have been working on this uh, for a while, at least a year, like you said, and you had to be mm -hmm. completely silent. Once the floodgates were opened, Frida will continue with you, you know, what was the reaction like already from the community when there's barely anything out about the game? What uh, has the response been so far? Well, exactly as as expected by our fan. I think it's also just because the games are so intimate where you... You, as a player, you put yourself in the avatar and you you live their experiences and relationships and losses and whatever else. So Bioware fans are already trained to become very emotionally connected to the characters that they're going to play. So, of course, they're really anxious and um, anxious, skeptical, excited, whatever. It's like getting a new roommate. 
right? Or a new, or like, a, or a new puppy. You're like, I really want to love this dog, but what if it's a nightmare? I don't know. So when they finally got names, of course, they all went bananas and were looking us up and like you wanted to ask questions, get to know us better. Um, 99% super, super, super positive. Crazy, crazy positive. What about that 1%? The 1% of negative um, has either been uh, subjectively negative, which is funny. Like I did see, I did see a Reddit comment. I mean, that's my fault for going to Reddit, but I did see a Reddit comment where the guy was like, I really hate this casting. She sounds so average and normal and there's nothing special about her voice. And I was like, yes, because that's exactly what it should be. You shouldn't, especially if it's someone who's going to be in your ear for hundreds of hours at a time. Uh, if it's something particularly like, I don't know, do you want to play as Gilbert Gottfried for 200 hours? I mean, no, 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 it's fine if you do. But um, that's quite a particular sound and voice and frequency, and yeah. you're going to have to be intimate with it. Versus Tom and I from Octodad have credits as literally every man and every woman because mm -hmm. we're so good at being relatable, commonplace, and blending in. So that was fine. And then the only other like, other half of the 1% has just been um, someone on a YouTube comment wrote, I, you know what, I just really hate her as a person. <laughs> which is cool off of an interview. And I looked in their channel and their channel, like they had several playlists of just like sad, porny videos that like scrambled cable videos that are still on YouTube somehow. So like, like nothing that I really take offense to. Yeah. 90 a, certain of, a certain type of yeah. person that would have done that. I, Tom, similar sort of situation. Is there kind of that massive divide with nearly everyone just saying, I can't wait. And then a bit more, uh, you know, with that 1% suggesting maybe you are, you know, the spawn of Satan. <laughs> I didn't get the spawn of Satan. No. I got, okay. but I did get the. Oh, it's Nolan North. <laughs> really? It's just no, they got Nolan North. It's Nolan North. Yeah, that was the one thing I got after they heard me, and it's even um, Nolan North uh, impersonation there, sir. Right? Yeah. Nolan North. No, uh, they got. I got that a little bit. Um, but otherwise, it's been very, very positive. A lot of people, very welcoming and exceptionally curious. Um but mostly welcoming. And again, I think that's part of the community that has been built around Mass Effect. And then I think also Bioware looking at that community and kind of fostering that because I think a lot of Bioware games, Mass Effect in particular, but a lot of them are built on you know, these relationships and stories they tell about and around these relationships and then pushing the envelope of what those relationships are and can be and the kinds of characters and relationships that they can portray in a video game. Mm -hmm. So you get a kind of community that is very uh, inclusive and welcoming. And then you have a lot of these stories about people saying, oh, you know, this game or character or something like that got me through, you know, uh, my parents splitting up or a really tough time of this or a bad relationship or just you know, the worst time in school ever, just whatever it is, these games have helped people in that respect. I'm sure lots of other games have done the same. But there's just something about this community that I'm picking up anyways that is very um, open, armed, and uh, accepting in that way. So we've that's had the mostly chance. what I'm Yeah, no, that, that's phenomenal because we've had the chance in the past to speak with some of the writers. And uh, one of my favorite talks was with uh, Caroline Livingstone mm. and her method for getting this out of the actors. And I think it is kind of unique from what I've uh, been able to gleam from uh, your profession and the guys that do that in terms of that experience of obviously what you can say of what you're not able to say because we're still uh, quite a ways away from the game that experience of working on a Bioware game with that team what was that uh, like did it feel like it was kind of a notch above maybe what you'd find in um, other organizations Hell yeah. Okay. I, I, I'll scream it from the mountaintop. So Bioware has been doing this for so long and you know, they don't like change genres of games, right? Um, they have it down to a science. And I, I think that the way they run sessions is exemplary for the industry. The caveat is that not every game is a dialogue, every game, and you're still going to have your grenades and reloadings and your, your call out MOBA FPS games or whatever that are not about like you and me, let's have an intimate conversation about our feelings, um, which is fine. But um man bioware really has it down they they story comes first with them so they make sure that we're informed about what the hell is going on if we don't know what's going on we can't do our jobs just flat out if you hear bad acting um very likely there's there was missing context in the session the actor 
wasn't directed properly, which means they just didn't know how they felt about X, Y, and Z character situation they were in. They didn't fully understand their own story. If we have all the places in all the, all the pieces in place, then we know how to feel. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, um, if, otherwise we're just, we're taking a shot and making it up. And sometimes we get it wrong if we're lacking information. So Caroline and, and the crew just, they make sure that we're very well immersed. Um, and also just, uh, I think Tom's experience was just very similar. They let us shoot from the hip quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So it's as natural as possible versus mm -hmm. making something really real melodramatic and over the top, because then uh, you get into kind of fake plastic territory, which doesn't serve as well. So. Yeah, Tom, yeah, yeah, you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of it does come down to uh, the process and things they put together. I mean, originally back in the day, and I, I think about um, something like uh, the original Baldur's Gate, you know, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of pages and they're casting, you know, hundreds of roles. Um, and then the first Mass Effect was on on printed paper, you know, on Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine what that process was like compared to the more digital process uh, that I think most everyone runs off of, but specifically what they're able to do um, at Bioware to make it as kind of immersive and off the hip um, as possible. Mm -hmm. And that has been a real pleasure to work with. And every now and then, not always, somebody else has already been recorded and you can hear their stuff. And it's almost like doing a scene. And it's absolutely, you know, it's absolutely wonderful because most of the time it's just one-off lines here and there. You don't have anybody. And as the player character, a lot of the time we've, we haven't had the person opposite. They're not done yet. So they're taking care of our stuff first mm -hmm. because most of our work is asking questions. And so without that there, you're just kind of going and going and going. And they've set up something that is, that is very specific specific to them and their work, but is also, I think, sp special, mm -hmm. I think. And the writing is special. Tom, have um, you started doing what I do? Like now in other sessions, I'm like, hey, we're going to do it the Mass Effect way. And I and I force um, my client to partner read with me if they can. <laughs> I make him do it. Because the way like uh, Tom and I don't necessarily do it the exact same way, but if we've got a scene like a back and forth with a character or some characters, um, what's worked for me to get through all that line count is um, have be read in by the director and so have them play the opposite part. And then when I respond, I just go ahead and get two to three takes out of the way. Mm -hmm. And now I just don't want to work any other way because it just gets it done and it gets it done right and I still get to play off of somebody else. So now I've just made my clients do it. And they have fun because they get to participate and we still get done in a timely fashion. Because otherwise, um, voice actors are usually left writing, reading lines out of context. And if it's just so much, it's so much harder if you're not talking to a person. The job is pretending that at all times you are talking to a person, but you just get like that extra 5% quality if you have a real person to play off of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's definitely, that's definitely part of it. And that speaks to the directors and engineers that we've worked with and that, that are exemplary. Mm -hmm. um, but like most, most recent memory, I have not had the opportunity to have a scene it's been like an ambient person or it was adapting something else. And so that dialogue didn't happen. So you just got to go, well, what's your process for this? Okay, sure. We're running down an Excel spreadsheet. You're going to shout, this happened and I react to it. You got it. Mm -hmm. And you go with that. Um, so it's, I haven't had the opportunity to tell somebody the right way to do things. <laughs> you yeah. will and you're gonna. That's oh, what yeah. I think. This is, no, this has been, um, you know, after doing certain things for years, and, and Frida has a, a much more extensive, especially video game resume than I do, but this process um, for me personally, but then also professionally, has been exceptionally special mm -hmm. because of the the level of, uh, of quality, professionalism, everything, of all of the players involved, from the directors to... Um, our most of the time, wonderful. Most of the time, we have had other engineers, of course, but uh, our wonderful Judy, Judy Lee, our engineer, and then the directors again, and then just the writing that comes through. I, a number of times, I've had certain scenes where I finished that, and I just said, "Can you send something up the chain to Bioware? Tell them how much I love that sequence. I don't know who wrote that sequence, but it's one of my favorite things I've done." And that would happen, you know, every week, every other week, and just say, "This is a brilliant little snippet." Please send them up the chain. This was a, you know, this was a pleasure to to play. 
I love this. I'm not even needed here. You guys just go back and forth. It's wonderful. Uh, you <laughs> talked about uh, a lot of that, of why it was special and why this kind of is a notch different. Something that is very iconic within the entire Mass Effect series is the ability for, I think, Freddie, you mentioned it there. It's that roommate. It's that character that is so close to you because your choices can be so radically different, but within that same characterization. For both of you, I imagine as actors, that has to be a very rewarding experience to not just know this is the one choice you have to make in this particular scene or in this situation, but just by the nature of the game, the level of interactivity, there's a lot of different ways this could play out. We just start to, um, this, uh, this particular game has definitive tracks that you can go down and the tracks are repeated with most options um, as far as like what kind of attitude you can take. So personally, um, I just started remembering how I felt in each um, potential dialogue branch. So I'd be like, okay, we're going down this track where I'm snarkier. Okay, I know how to be. It's like a slightly, it's like uh, just moving the dial a little bit on the same character if you're in a different mood and just playing it that way. So is that more difficult or, or just, you know, a little bit easier because you can, you know, bring so many different characterizations to this? Because it seems like it'd be really easy to overplay that a little too much. It just feels like getting a second shot at the scene. No, Tom, oh. like, you know, mm -hmm. like we, we did it one. It's like, so, you know, I mean, Tom, I'm, I'm talking out of my butt because Tom has actually been a long term um, theater performer. But it is my understanding that when you're long time in a play or a musical or whatever, um, the best thing about it is that every night you have an opportunity to either do better, which is a meaningless generic term, or just do something different or switch it up. Um, just to make it interesting for yourself. Because the audience doesn't know. They weren't there the night before. Um, so I, personally, it's it seems the same way when we go back and do the scene, you know, with a slightly different option. It's like, okay, well, I have a, I have a second chance to do something that's more interesting for myself. And if it works for the director, then everybody's happy. Yeah, I think another portion of it, uh, portion, another portion of it is the opportunity to really explore all the bits and pieces of the different characters. Because in one, in one situation, you will have a nice conversation with this person, and then maybe it gets a little intimate. And then as you go down that intimate path, you can turn around and dump them, or kiss them, or stay friends. And you, you get that opportunity to explore that portion of the character and the other characters and how they will react. Again, it's all in writing, but... You get to play that. You get to have that moment. And a lot of times, when if it's if it's something that's set, you get to play this one version of it. There is no other version of the play, and you're done. And I think that opportunity is some of the fun of video games in general, because of the player interactivity. You get the opportunity to make these different choices and play those different choices as an actor. And then as you explore more of the character and those those facets and those different sides of them, it fills out that character. And then when you find those different facets later on, as you work on the game, like Frida said, you go, oh yeah, I remember how this works, go. And then you slip back into that version of the character in those different situations. So you basically think, have no opportunity to be bored ever, mm -hmm. whatsoever. <laughs> Absolutely, keeps you on your toes yeah. and it's, it's endlessly entertaining in that respect. Well, those moments that you uh, referred to right there, those things that you just kind of flippantly said of, yeah, you could dump them or be with them. Those moments for some gamers become their influence for making great works of art or dedicating hundreds of hours because that moment was so powerful and so important to them. It must be kind of cool now looking back to say, I have said something, we have both said something in these scenes that's going to mean so much to so many different people. Frida, maybe we'll start with you since Tom had a bit of a chance last time. Oh, I'm looking forward to the fan fiction, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the stuff that Tom and I don't do in the game that the gamers are like, this will be rectified. And they just write, you know, an 18 page novella about the people we should have slept with. Um, that's what I'm looking forward to. And the fan art. And all the, the fan art that you can't scrub out of your eyes. That's the fun part of me. Because, like, I know what I did, and I know how everything ties up in the game. And that's fine. I've been there. I've done that. I want to see what the fans come up with. Tom? Yeah, that's definitely a part of it. I think, too, when you get into there, into the, into the booth and doing your work, uh, especially early on, a little bit less now, it's kind of settled in. 
Um, it'll probably come rushing back when the game comes out or close to that time. But especially early on, I would walk in and go, okay, this is Mass Effect and it's this and, uh, you know, Jen Hale and Mr. Mir and, all right, nope, nope, shut up, shut up, shut it down, shut it down, go to work. Yeah. You know, and you have to acknowledge everybody else's work and the quality thereof and then bring your own thing. And so that was part of it is going, okay, this is, I guess this is a big deal. You're involved in a big deal now. And you just shut that crap down as soon as possible and then show up and go to work. And so uh, that's been a large, larger part of thing is just showing up and go to work. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'd speak to that a lot. I get figured out really quickly when I started working. I've only been in LA. I've only uh, lived in LA since earlier this year. And I've been, I'll have been a voice actor for four years with an LA agency in uh, April of 2017. Um, so I'm kind of newer to being around recognizable names and faces and stuff. And just very quickly, I picked up that you have to shut it down because you are there to work, not to be a fan. I mean, there's there's a time and a place, right? Like if you're in a space that is designed to... Um, get all your fangasms out so like a convention or a panel or whatever then yeah go crazy because that's that's what we're here for but if we're all there to work and again like i mentioned earlier studio studio time is paid for like we're starting at a finite time and we are stopping at a finite time and if i'm the reason that we don't get what we need recorded i'm not gonna work (laughs) again Mm -hmm. um so i've walked into sessions where there's um a, a person who is like a celebrity to me and I have to clamp that down really fast. And I kind of pretend I don't know them. And I say, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Frida. And they're like, hi, I'm someone that you've watched in a movie or TV show growing up. Not a big deal, right? I'm like, no, not a big deal. And then I'll go home and flap my hands around and scream, right? But um, yeah. that that is 100% what it's like working on Mass Effect. It's if, a if I look behind the scenes, I guess, for those big moments that seem to matter so much to people that love these games. Yeah, I, like Tom and I are... are Tom more than me because he's he's the RPG uh, freak between the two of us. Um, We're very well aware of the responsibility and the expectation to um, not ruin somebody's beloved franchise. We just can't think about that, you know, four hours at a time. We're just like, nope, I'm here. I'm here on this planet doing this thing. And nothing else matters. Not um, that I have to buy more dog food or in my case, cat food. Not that I have to make dinner tonight. Nope, nope, nothing else is going on. And then we can go home and collapse in in a puddle and cry a little. And about that, you know, there'll be days when I just, I, I'm driving back home and the session was great. We hit a new line count or there was one of those scenes that was just the best thing to play ever. Um, and it was just an absolute treat. And I'm driving home and it's great. And I feel great. And everything's really awesome. I get home, I walk the dog and I'm picking up dog poop. <laughs> yeah. And that's the moment you go, all right, shut it down. You had fun. That's great. That's not life. This this picking up poop. This is life. <laughs> and this and this is good too. Guys, you know what I'm gonna do after this interview? I'm mean? gonna clean my toilets. <laughs> See with my bare hands. hands. All of this modesty exactly. here, but really, like there is one thing that I think, you know, we're not in the studio. You have time to talk about it now, you have time to consider it. For a lot of people, like we mentioned earlier, this is a keynote experience for their own experience if they haven't feel like they've been represented in media because of their sexual orientation uh-huh. or because of their uh, particular proclivity or who they are traditionally mass effect games have been an avenue and an opportunity for them to have a voice so absolutely everything you said you got to separate yourself from that but right now i'm asking you to dive right in to that type of feeling and that idea that what you're doing matters to someone in a way that I, I think is kind of profound. Is there ever that kind of thought process or anything around uh, that where I'm going with here? I, I get that off of Twitter daily now. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've had um, women, girls who like in the, in the same way, like we all have, you know, people that we relate to um, who we don't know personally for X, Y, Z reason. So I've already had, Um, girls and women be like, oh, she's awesome, outspoken, she loves cats, me too! And that, and they're already, like, digging into that, right? Or, um, yesterday I had, like, I'm a big fan of RuPaul's Drag Race and drag queens in general and all that stuff, and I was posting some nonsense the other day, and some, uh, some cute gay boy on Twitter was like, uh, she was this in Evolve, and she's in Mass Effect, and she loves RuPaul, did I just go straight? 
and that's <laughs> that also works for me. So I'm I'm happy that that me as a person can offer something um, to people who are going to be spending hundreds of hours in my body with my voice if they choose um, something where they feel like they can already relate to me. And and I know it's kind of it is it's a bizarre thing, but like we can freely admit sometimes we pretend celebrities that we don't know are our friends, especially if we're going to spend um, a few hours having an adventure with them. Like as an example, if you're a Harry Potter kid and you grew up watching the Harry Potter movies, you are at Hogwarts. You are, you know, a wizard or a witch or whatever, and you're hanging out and you're doing the thing. Um, and you walk away and in your head, those characters are your friends. And when you see those actors out of context, you want to think fondly of them. That's why everything is ruined if somebody is, you know, a criminal in their private life or whatever. But you want to hold on to the fantasy because it makes you feel good and it gives you five seconds of relief from whatever's going on in your life. So uh, that's <laughs> that's something that Tom and I are pretty well aware of because we're fans too. Mm -hmm. And we indulge in that too. And characters matter to us as well. So, you know, God, I hope I can provide that for somebody. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a big thing too. That God, I hope I can provide that is definitely here and in the back of my head. Um, just in little bits and pieces as you're performing it, I'm thinking, boy, this this better be good. This better be damn good. I mean, I'm bringing my A game. That is my job. But I really hope this is good and people enjoy it because of how much the series means to me. I played the whole trilogy. Um, I taught voice acting at Columbia College in Chicago, and I taught using Bioware scripts. So I probably was teaching from scripts of writers that I'm working with right now, you know, whose work I am performing. And I remember playing the original trilogy in two different homes over the course of however many years living in and around Chicago. Um, so to have the opportunity to work on it has been phenomenal. And then you go, oh, I got to make this good, too. Because now it's it's more important on a personal level than seeing what it means to everybody else as they start to follow us on Twitter and figure things out. You know, we have these fans, and they've not heard a darn thing we've done yet. Thank you. <laughs> but I ain't even said anything yet. Don't, you know, don't get ahead of yourselves. I may not even be good. Um, but you got to trust the process. You got to trust all these other people that are involved from Caroline and all the other directors that we work with who say, no, this is good. This is working. And I think, at least for me, I don't know how Frida's feeling. It's probably similar. But uh, it came down to casting because at the beginning, I thought, oh, I don't know. Really? I'm doing this? Okay. And then over the course of the next few sessions, I found the work, the character, all of it kind of falling into place. And the performance just happening, not necessarily easily, but naturally. And historically for me in theater and other contexts, that meant good casting. You know, when somebody shows up and does the job and they're fantastic and there's no question, it seems to be easy, but it's more just a good fit. Mm -hmm. That's good casting. And so I slowly came to the realization that, okay, maybe I'm supposed to be here. Maybe this is, maybe this is my job. Yeah, imposter syndrome was definitely there present. I mean, Tom and mm -hmm. I found out, um, we've mentioned this elsewhere, we found out early on, we figured out that we were in the same game <laughs> just because we were trying to have lunch and one of us is like, I have a session at this studio. And I was like, I have a session at oh, that studio. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let's set the stage for that a little bit. That sounds pretty exciting. So you both had this knowledge in your heads. And do you, you want to do this? Able, yeah, if you could. Yeah. If, uh, well, do you want to do, you have, do the story? I think we have the married couple problem where we remember it a little differently. <laughs> a little, yeah, yeah. My, I just got married yesterday, and my brand new twenty-four hour husband just turned around and be like, "What?" And I'm like, "No, not you. The other, <laughs> my other husband, brother. Per, never brother. mind. Mind your own well, business." Let's, let's pause for um, a second. Congratulations, <laughs> by the way. Thank you. Thank for you. Talking to us today, I do appreciate it. No, I'm happy to. We uh, my my brand new husband is a brand new expat from Scotland. He's a oh, sound designer cool. in the video game industry. I used to be a sound designer in the game industry, so our community is ultra small. I did not expect to marry within my community. It just sort of happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were we. This was a year and a half long process. Um, we waited seven months on a fiance visa and uh, finally made him legal yesterday, so he doesn't get deported and onwards and upwards and all that. Um, so uh. So Tom moved to Los Angeles last year. He and I knew each other from Octodad. Because mm -hmm. um, just in general, the you'll hear this a lot, and it's not, uh, it's not a line. Voice actors are probably the friendliest, least competitive 
uh, least possessive, least territorial um, community of all performers. Because mm -hmm. there is, you hear this and you don't believe it at first. I didn't. There is enough work to go around. There is space for you. You can make space for yourself as a unique voice, perspective, and personality. Um, and because we work in isolation, when we finally get to run into, meet with, work with another voice actor, we're just so damn happy. <laughs> we're just so damn happy. Just to, it's we're like dogs. We're just like hi, hi, hi. How are you? How are you? Nice to meet you. Hi, hi. Okay, let's go play. <laughs> we're we're at the dog park yeah. because most of the time we're. I mean, we're to keep it going. We're in a kennel. We work. We work in a dark box by ourselves. Um, the only people we talk to on a regular basis are the people who are paying us, which is not necessarily healthy. And then go home to our families, or if you don't have a family, your pet, because everyone in LA has a pet because that's the one person who won't reject them. Um, so because you that's have a the food. editorial there. All right, continue. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so Tom moved here uh, to LA and last May. We're, last yeah, May. last May. So May of 2015, and we were trying to meet up and he's like i have a session in burbank at the studio and i was like i have a session this week in burbank at that studio interesting let's play a game i'm calling the game are we in the same game and tom's like i, I uh oh uh, and i was like is your game in space he's like maybe and i was like are you being directed from canada maybe maybe <laughs> And I just cut to you, and I was like, oh, sorry to tell you, Tom. I'm, I'm real sorry to lay this on you, but uh, I'm the player character. And he was like, no, I'm the player character. What? <laughs> and it was about 15 minutes just devolving into what? About 15 minutes of that back and forth. Um, and then we had to come up with a code word so we yeah. could speak about the game kind of in public or at least around other people. Oh, yeah. I've been calling it. We've been calling it Burrito for a year burrito. are you on burrito this week well it's just because it's because innoc it's innocuous everybody yeah. loves burritos we are in southern california mm -hmm. yep. um so yeah it's been burrito for a year and a half so i'm st we still i would still call burrito in my household it's just easier yeah it, well it is nice to hear because in the in the narrative you are brother and sister and it, it, this is kind of unique in the mass effect series i remember speaking with mark Mir and uh, jennifer hale years ago and they said they finally met each other and had like an extensive communication when they were nearly done the third game because their characters, wow. there's, you know, no interaction like that. You guys are coming from a very different perspective. Having that, do you think that kind of helped with the process that you guys had some interaction that uh, presumably there is some, you know, interaction in the game between you two and the fact that people don't have to choose necessarily between one of you disappearing forever and the other one being like the person they love and want to be. I think when I've, when I've banter with Tom's character in the game, I'm, you know, in part bantering with Tom. Like, yeah. I think our, our personal relationship does play into it a bit. Um, it would be, it's, it's part of the job to act like, I mean, any interview you've ever seen when someone's doing a press checker for a movie and the interviewer does the, the inevitable so what was it like filming a sex scene <laughs> you're looking at two co-workers who came in said hi nice to meet you all right and they spend how many ever hours choreographing the most intimate thing you can do with another person with someone they hardly know that's that's the job and it's hard freaking work it's so much easier if you have any kind of a relationship um with a person uh and like ugh, we tom and i didn't get to perform any of um our scenes together in the same room but if we had each other's um view already recorded and we could do playback it was just easy because it's like well i'm talking to tom i don't have to pretend what what it's like to talk to tom it's just again five percent of the work is a little bit better because of that mm -hmm. yeah and i think too um and we're finding this out as there's kind of more promotional opportunities and the Twitterverse and things yeah. like that and bioware is already tapped into it the fact that we do know each other and have the relationship that we do have, a positive one, I think, um, we are able to kind of use that. And we banter back and forth as we do, and people seem to enjoy it and think that's cool. Um, which, by which, the way, Bioware had no idea. Like, Bioware didn't really? know we knew each other. Bioware mm -mm, didn't mm -mm. look at Octodad. They they had no They thought they just hired, you know, their two random picks from L.A. We told them. We're like, we, we know each other. Like, what? what? So Caroline was in shock. And, and that story was kind of like, yeah, and that story that, that Frida told is kind of, you know, one of their favorite little things is mm -hmm. us kind of breaking NDA just a little bit. And I, and I think with that, 
the, that little break though, the friend DA, as you could say, as mm-hmm. you could say, it's been actually great to have somebody to kind of share this experience with over the course of the last year. Mm-hmm. Um, as this being the first gig that I booked after moving to Los Angeles and things like that. And my wife doesn't want to hear about work anymore. It's been nice to bandy back and forth with somebody who is not just familiar with the work, but like intimately familiar with exactly what I've been working on mm-hmm. week to week, month to month. Um, and that's been an absolute treat because so many times because of non-disclosure agreements, things like that, you just cannot discuss this work with anybody, whether it goes well or not. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting to kind of follow a lot of um, both of your social media and you guys almost discovering parts of the game from the ad campaign. Because apparently, you know, <laughs> from what we've been able to, I think, Tom, I saw some uh, messages from you saying like, oh, that's what these characters are. I, this is the first time I get to see you know, a lot of these characters in their full experience, that must be a very unique position to come from. Because in many ways, you intimately know so many of the characters that you spent, you know, over the year, last year communicating with and having these sessions with, you, their name has been on the page. Now seeing them in their full glory, you guys have worked on video games before, but Tom, what is that like to see these video game characters, Bioware characters that you seem to already know so well? Oh, I want to go back and re-record this or that. <laughs> oh, it's really? already the can that's been in the can for three or four months or something like that. Um, but I'm a perfectionist. That's just that's just me being me. There are plenty of times when they will say something. Oh, we've got it, and I'll go. Can I get one more? And they'll say, No, we have to move on. Are you sure? Because I've got this other perfect, you know, take in my head. Um, uh, it's fun, and I know we already have the work in the can. We don't necessarily need to know what everybody looks like, um, but I. I'm enjoying the reveal process, and there are a couple sequences that I know we've. I, oh, that's how big that room is. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, we should that's do this different development. And and sometimes, yeah. so sometimes that gets lost in the chain too, because the writers might write and the, describe in the script what they want, and then by the time it gets to animation, they between like level design and animation, they come mm-hmm. up with something else, and then it's only when it's cobbled all together we're like, oh, oh God, okay, uh, huh. Cool. Nobody told me I was yelling across a ravine or else right. I wouldn't sound like such an idiot. Oh, that's a vault. Okay. Yeah. Like just, but that's, I mean, that's, that's just a consequence of, of game development. You don't, we're not working for an auteur. We're not working for an indie team. This, these are hundreds of people in different parts of a building and different studios. Yeah. I mean, because yes. all of Bioware, Austin, Montreal, and Edmonton are working on this. Um, they just don't have the benefit of being in each other's face 100 percent of the time their own you know their own their own little cubicles and offices getting it done so that's why the polish phase is so important um which i mean excitement you know of being able to see kind of what this is all turning into did you have that freedom essentially imagining what this would eventually look like where it's going how much information did you have during this process uh what these scenes would eventually look like uh uh, we very rarely got to see stuff because I mean they they take um performance capture with act like all the all the mocap performance capture you see in game that that's not us. I mean people have lovingly asked if so how much mocap did you guys do and I'm like you know what my mocap is my mocap is being a woman and not deciding on whether I'm hot and co- or cold and taking off my hoodie every other minute and annoying everybody most of all myself. That's my mocap for this game. Um, so they spend an awful lot of time. Uh, blocking out scenes with um, mocap actors and doing performance capture and then we're responsible for matching that timing for the animators benefit but I mean we don't see we don't really see the cutscenes and stuff so it's I'm as excited as everybody else when a video comes out Mm -hmm. because I actually get to see the game so I've I've seen next to nothing um, which I'm fine with (laughs) so um, I don't know it's kind of nice being excited with everybody else for once you know, rather than like holding it and being like, oh, I'm having a party of one. Yeah. Yeah. You get to be part of the process, I guess. Yeah. yeah there's, there's a weird portion of that where you are coming out of it, out of it as somebody who's working on the game. You're part of the process. But then you have this kind of fan perspective with everybody else. It's a strange kind of dichotomy mm-hmm. where you're involved, but you really have no idea what's going on until these gameplay videos and trailers and things like that come out. So it's a, like she said, it's a it's a treat to see those things, and we go, oh, that's what that person looks like. Oh, that what that that's what that person sounds like. Sometimes we don't even know that until the videos hit. Yeah, oh, I mean, 
concept art and um, untextured scenes and all that stuff that just it, it never does the final product justice. It's just not the same. Well, again, we've been able to get 40 minutes out of no, I can't talk about Mass Effect. So a huge thank you to both of you for taking the time to talk about this process a little bit. I just want to convey once more, you know, what this kind of means for a lot of people that really, really want this to be. It's such a difficult position to be in for Bioware. They have to strike gold, you know, once more. Uh, Frida, we'll start with you if you don't mind. I guess a message to the fans that really can't wait, that maybe are a little bit nervous as anyone would when their favorite thing is coming back again. Is there anything uh, I guess you'd like to say to them? Well, we're as excited as you are. We're as concerned as you are. We're as um, preemptively hopeful as you are. We want you to enjoy the experience as much as we hope that you do and as much as we enjoyed recording it. I mean, we I know Tom and I busted our butts every day and just did our best, so... I hope you have fun and enjoy it. Tom? Yeah, absolutely. I'll reiterate I'll reiterate all of that, which is everybody's working exceptionally hard and every day I learn the more names and people who are involved in it and they are equally as excited for the finished product and to be working on it as you guys are to have it in your hot little hands. And if the final product, usually um I've found that great Art, I guess, um, does come from a lot of hard work, but also a place of joy, a place of just that kind of unmitigated, bountiful fun in some instances. Not all art, but something like this. And everybody that I've worked with is having a ball and really enjoying putting this together. And if that is any indication of what's going to come out, sometime spring 2017 um this is gonna be good i don't think there's anybody who's working on mass effect andromeda who shuffles into work begrudgingly and grumbles under their breath and then like <laughs> knocks stuff off their desk i i mean I, a, yeah I, I even if you're tired even if it's been a long week i know tom and i have you know come out of those sessions just ragged because you're your emotions and your adrenal glands are on high for four hours. And then personally, I just like usually need to cuddle in a corner and mm -hmm. like not talk to anyone um, for an hour. Um, I, even the next day, I still go back in with a skip in my step. How can I not? Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you both so very much. Uh, I know you all said no. I'm going to ask again. Can I get a goodbye from each of your characters from, of course, just a final goodbye from Scott and Sarah? <laughs> uh, okay okay tom you ready <laughs> are, we, are we gonna do this or are we, are we well, going to no i th uh, well i think i'm just gonna do the same thing i always do where it's like hey i'm sarah Ryder and i'm the pathfinder bye <laughs> i just see i just see us going down forever of like arguing <laughs> who is the pathfinder <laughs> because we can't be the pathfinder at the same time no nope. yeah so oh. i'm 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 the pathfinder i'm the pathfinder suck it no, I'm Scott Ryder, and I'm the Pathfinder. Whatever. <sighs> <laughs> Xander Burkowski, BGS Talk Radio, AM 640.